All right, my pumpkin bars weren't done yet. Okay, let's see if I can get through the next part. Anyway, so Homer comments on servants not doing what they should once the master is out. And then he also says Zeus takes half the manhood of a man when they go into captivity and slavery. Kind of saying once somebody becomes a slave, they no longer are their own person. And so they become lazy and only do what somebody tells them because they really have nothing to live for. Very interesting and rather progressive too, I would say, for the time period. It's so basically, it sounds like he might be against slavery. Okay, continuing on. Bottom of page 320. Eumaeus crossed the court and went straight forward into the Megaran among the suitors. But death and darkness in that instant closed the eyes of Argus, who had seen his master Odysseus after twenty years. And that's Argus. That's all he gets in the book. All right, moving on. Long before anyone else, Telemachus caught sight of the gray woodsman coming from the door and called him over with a quick jerk of his head. Eumaeus's narrowed eyes made out an empty bench beside the one the carver used, that servant who had no respite, carving for the suitors. This bench he took possession of and placed it across the table from Telemachus for his own use. Then the two men were served cuts from a roast and bread from a bread basket. At no long interval, Odysseus came through his own doorway as a mendicant, humped like a bundle of rags over his stick. He settled on the inner ashwood sill, leaning against the door jam, cypress timber, the skilled carpenter planed years ago and set up with a plumb line. Now Telemachus took an entire loaf and a double handful of roast meat. Then he said to the forester, Give these to the stranger there, but tell him to go among the suitors on his own. He may beg all he wants. This hanging back is no asset to a hungry man. The swineherd rose at once, crossed to the door, and halted by Odysseus. Friend, he said, Telemachus is pleased to give you these, but he commands you to approach the suitors. You may ask all you want from them. He adds, your shyness is no asset to a beggar. The great tactician, lifting up his eyes, cried, Zeus aloft, a blessing on Telemachus. Let all things come to pass as he desires. Palms held out in the beggar's gesture. He received the bread and meat and put it down before him on his knapsack, lowly table. Then he fell to devouring it, devouring it. Meanwhile, the harper in the great room sang a song. Not till the man was fed did the sweet harper end his singing, whereupon the company made the walls ring again with talk. Unseen, Athena took her place beside Odysseus, whispering in his ear, Yes. Try the suitors. You may collect a few more loaves and learn who are the decent lads and who are vicious, although not one can be excused from death. Okay, that line that Athena said there is definitely important because in a little bit, um, Odysseus kind of gives a warning to one of the nicer men and kind of wants him to leave but none are excused from death because the gods have decreed it. So again, this is how fate seems to play such a huge role in what people thought during this time period. So even if they're nice and would like to make amends, there's no hope for them. There's no turning back. There's no opportunity to change. There's uh, no second chances. Very, very gloomy sort of belief system here. Okay. So he appealed to them, one after another, going from left to right with open palm, as though his lifetime had been spent in beggary. And they gave bread for pity, wondering, though, at the strange man, who could this beggar be? Where did he come from? Each would ask his neighbor, till in their midst the goatherd, Melanthius, raised his voice. Here, just a word for me, my lords, who court our illustrious queen. This man, this foreigner, I saw him on the road. The swineherd here was leading him this way. Who, what, or whence he claims to be, I could not say for sure. At this, Antinous turned on the swineherd brutally, saying, You famous breeder of pigs, why bring this fellow here? Are we not plagued enough with beggars, foragers, and such rats? 
You find the company too slow at eating up your lord's estate, is that it? So you call this scarecrow in? The forester replied, Antinous, what well born you are, but that was not well said. Who would call in a foreigner, unless an artisan with skill to serve the realm, a healer or prophet or a builder, or one whose harp and song might give us joy? All these are sought for on the endless earth, but when have beggars come? By invitation, who puts a field mouse in his granary? My lord, you are a hard man, and you always were, more so than others of this company, hard on all Odysseus's people and me. But this I can forget, as long as Penelope lives on, the wise and tender mistress of this hall, as long as Prince Telemachus. But he broke off at a look from Telemachus, who said, Be still. Spare me a long-drawn answer to this gentleman. With his unpleasant pleasantness, he will forever make strife where he can and goad the others on. It's just so ironic that Antinous is complaining about Eumaeus bringing a beggar home. This isn't his home. He has no right whatsoever to complain about anybody Eumaeus decides to bring into this house. Ah, okay. All right. So Eumaeus does kind of answer back. Telemachus silences him. He doesn't want a fight to start now. And also he just is sick of hearing Antinous. So very bottom of page 323. He turned and spoke out clearly to Antinous. What fatherly concern you show me. Frighten this unknown fellow, would you, from my hall with words that promise blows? May God forbid it. Give him a loaf. Am I a niggard? No, I call on you to give and spare your qualms as to my mother's loss or anyone's. Not that in truth you have such care at heart. Your heart is all in feeding, not in giving. Antinous replied, what high and mighty talk, Telemachus, no holding you. If every suitor gave what I may give him, he could be kept for months, kept out of sight. He reached under the table for the footstool his shining feet had rested on, and this he held up so that all could see his gift. But all the rest gave alms, enough to fill the beggar's pack with bread and roast meat. So it looked as though Odysseus had had his taste of what these men were like, and could return scot-free to his own doorway. But halting now before Antinous, he made a little speech to him, said he, Well, you remember this about Odysseus, he never knows when to shut up. So he could have just gone back to the doorway and uh, sat there and ate his food that he got, but no, he has to go stand in front of Antinous and tar start talking with him. Give a mite, friend. I would not say myself you are the worst man of the young Achaeans, the noblest, rather kingly by your look. Therefore, you'll give more bread than others do. Let me speak well of you as I pass on over the boundless earth. I, too, you know, had fortune once, lived well, stood well with men, and gave alms often to poor wanderers, like this one that you see. I, to all sorts, no matter in what dire want. I own servants, many, God knows, and all the rest that goes with being prosperous, as they say. But Zeus, the son of Cronus, brought me down. No telling why he would have it, but he made me go to Egypt with a company of rovers, a long sail to the south for my undoing. Up the broad Nile and into the river bank I brought my dipping squadron. There, indeed, I told the men to stand guard at the ships. I sent patrols out to the rising ground, but reckless greed carried my crews away. To plunder the Egyptian farms, they bore off wives and children, killed what men they found. The news ran on the wind to the city. A night cry and sunrise brought both infantry and horsemen, filling the river plain with dazzle of bronze. Then Zeus, Lord of Lightning, threw my men into a blind panic. No one dared stand against that host closing around us. Their sighing weapons left our dead in piles, but some they took alive into forced labor myself among them, and they gave me then to one Demeter, a traveler son of Iasus, who ruled at Cyprus. He conveyed me there from that place, working northward miserably. But here, Antinous broke in, shouting, 
God, what evil wind blew in this pest? Get over, stand in the passage, nudge my table, will you? Egyptian whips are sweet to what you'll come to hear, you nosing rat, making your pitch to everyone. These men have br bread to throw away on you because it is not theirs. Who cares? Who spares another's food when he has more than plenty? With guile, Odysseus drew away, then said, A pity that you have more looks than heart. You'd grudge a pinch of salt from your own larder to your own handyman. You sit there fat on others' meat and cannot bring yourself to rummage out a crust of bread for me. The ang then anger made Antinous' heart beat hard, and glowering under his brows, he answered, Now you think you'll shuffle off and get away after that impudence? Oh, no, you don't. The stool he let fly hit the man's right shoulder on the packed muscle under the shoulder blade, like solid rock for all the effect one saw. Odysseus only shook his head, containing thoughts of bloody work as he walked on, then sat and dropped his loaded bag again upon the door sill. Facing the whole crowd, he said, and eyeing them all, One word only, my lords and suitors of the famous queen, one thing I have to say. There's no pain, no burden for the heart when blows come to a man, and he defending his own cattle, his own cows and lambs. Here it was otherwise. Antinous hit me for being driven on by hunger. How many bitter seas men cross for hunger. If beggars interest the gods, if there are furies pent in the dark to avenge a poor man's wrong. Then may Antinous meet his death before his wedding day. So there's a prophecy for you. Then said, you pithy son, Antinous, enough! You didn't be quiet where you are or shamble elsewhere unless you want these lads to stop your mouth, pulling you by the heels or hands and feet over the whole floor till your back is peeled. But now... The rest were mortified, and someone spoke from the crowd of young bucks to rebuke him. A poor show, that. Hitting this famished tramp, bad business. If he happened to be a god, you know they go in foreign guise, the gods do, looking like strangers, turning up in towns and settlements to keep an eye on manners, good or bad. And that was just a belief at the time. But at this notion, Antinous only shrugged. Um, you can kind of see a comparison right there between Antinous and Polyphemus, because when Odysseus ended up in the Cyclops' cave and said, well, you should treat us well, he said, I don't care for those rules at all. And here Antinous just kind of shrugs off the tradition, the belief of that time. Telemachus, after the blow his father bore, sat still without a tear, though his heart felt the blow. Slowly he shook his head from side to side, containing murderous thoughts. Penelope, on the higher level of her room, had heard the blow and knew who gave it. Now she murmured, Would God you be, could be hit yourself, Antinous, hit by Apollo's bow shot. And Irinome, her housekeeper, put in, He and no other. If all we pray for came to pass, not one would live till dawn. So Penelope and her housemaid there are kind of wishing the suitors were all killed. Her gentle mistress said, Oh, Nan, they are a bad lot. They intend ruin for all of us. But Antinous appears a blacker-hearted hound than any. Here is a poor man come, a wanderer driven by want to bake his bread. And every one in hall gave bits to cram his bag. Only Antinous threw a stool and banged his shoulder. So she described it, sitting in her chamber among her maids, while her true lord was eating. Then she called in the forester and said, Go to that man on my behalf, Eumaeus. Send him here so I can greet and question him. Abroad in the great world, he may have heard rumors about Odysseus, may have known him. Then you replied, O swineherd, Ah, my queen, if these Achaean sprigs could hush their babble, the man could tell you tales to charm your heart. Three days and nights I kept him in my hut. He came straight off a ship, you know, to me. There's no end to what he made me hear of his hard roving, and I listened eyes upon him as a minstrel drinks in a tale. Um, <coughs> excuse me. 
as a man drinks in a tale, a minstrel sings, a minstrel taught by heaven to touch the hearts of men. At such a song the listener becomes rapt and still, just so. I found myself enchanted by this man. He claims an old tie with Odysseus, too, in his home country, the Minoan land of Crete. From Crete he came, a rolling stone washed by the gales of life, this way and that to our own beach. If he can be believed... He has news of Odysseus near at hand, alive in the rich country of Thesprosia, bringing a mass of treasure home. Then wise Penelope said again, Go, call him, let him come here. Let him tell me that tale again for my own ears. Our friends can drink their cups outside or stay in hall being so carefree, and why not? Their stores lie intact in their homes, both food and drink, with only servants left to take a little. But these men spend their days around our house, killing our beeves, our fat goats, and our sheep, carousing, drinking up our good dark wine, sparing nothing, squandering everything. No champion like Odysseus takes our part. Ah, if he comes again, no falcon ever struck more suddenly, suddenly than he will with his son to avenge this outrage. The great hall below at this point rang with a tremendous sneeze. ka -chow! from Telemachus, like an acclamation and laughter sees Penelope. Okay, so you have to know that this is actually a Homeric omen. If somebody sneezes, that the words are supposed to come true. So Penelope had just said, Odysseus and Telemachus, we're going to avenge the outrage. And then Telemachus sneezed, and she's like, whoa, maybe it's going to happen. Then quickly, lucidly, she went on, go, call the stranger straight to me. Did you hear that, Emmaus? My son's thundering sneeze at what I said. May death come of a sudden, so may death relieve us clean as that of all the suitors. Let me add one thing. Do not overlook it. If I can see this man has told the, the truth, I promise him a warm new cloak and tunic. With all this in his head, the forester went down the hall and halted near the beggar, saying aloud, Good father, your call by the wise mother of Telemachus, Penelope, the queen, despite her troubles, is moved by a desire to hear your tales about her lord, and if she finds them true, she'll see you clothed in what you need, a cloak and a fresh tunic. You may have your belly full each day you go about this realm begging, for all may give and all they wish. Now said Odysseus, the old soldier, friend, I wish this instant I could tell my facts to the wise daughter of Icarus Penelope, and I have much to tell about her husband. We went through much together. But just now this hard crowd worries me. They are, you said, infamous to the very rim of heaven for violent acts. And here just now this fellow gave me a bruise. What had I done to him? But who would lift a hand for me? Telemachus? Anyone else? No. Bid the queen be patient. Let her remain till sundown in her room. And then, if she will seat me near the fire, inquire tonight about her lord's return. M my rags are sorry, cover. You know that. I showed my sad condition first to you. The woodsman heard him out, then returned, but the queen met him on her threshold, crying, "'Have you not brought him? Why, what is he thinking? Has he some fear of overstepping, shy about these inner rooms, a hangdog beggar?' To this you answered, friend Eumaeus, "'No, he has reasons, as another might, and well, not to tempt any sword-play from these drunkards. Be patient. Wait,' he says, "'till darkness falls, and... Oh, my queen, for you, too, that is better. Better to be alone with him and question him and hear him out without any suitors around, you know, to bother them. Penelope replied, he is no fool. He sees how it could be. Never were mortal men like these for bullying and brainless arrogance. Thus she accepted what had been proposed. So he went back into the crowd. He joined Telemachus and said at once in whispers, his head bent so that no one else might hear. Dear prince, I must go home to keep good watch on hut and swine, and look to my own affairs. Everything here is in your hands. Consider your own safety before the rest. Take care not to get hurt. Many are dangerous here. May Zeus destroy them first before we suffer. Telemachus said, Your wish is mine, uncle. Go when your meal is finished, then come back at dawn, and bring good victims for a slaughter. Everything here is in my hands indeed, and in the disposition of the gods. Taking his seat on the smooth bench again, Emmaus ate and drank his fill, then rose to climb the mountain trail back to his swine, leaving the Megaron and court behind him, crowded with banqueters. These had their joy of dance and song as day waned into evening. 
really quick, we're going to be skipping book 18, Blows and a Queen's Beauty. But um, what happens in this book is that Iris, who's really a beggar, comes along and uh, very much encouraged by the suitors. Iris and Odysseus have a huge fight and well, you can just imagine Odysseus, of course, does win. But uh, Odysseus sits at the gate, and as all the suitors troop in, they are kind of stopping and leaving something for Odysseus. And it's a nice way for him to, again, size up all these suitors one at a time. And so Odysseus warns Amphimenus, trouble is coming. And uh, he kind of remembers this suitor is from a good family, and he doesn't want him to get hurt, wants him to get out of this. And Amphibit and Feminus knows that wrath is coming. Like he totally believes Odysseus, but he can't leave because he's bound by Athena. The fates are in control. Um, and he goes into the hall anyway. Penelope, meanwhile, is preparing herself to show herself to the suitors. And uh, she uh, has uh, an exchange with Telemachus, first of all, and then... Um, has an exchange with Emmaus, or sorry, Eurymachus, and the suitors bring in some gifts. Eurymachus taunts Odysseus once again. Um, there's some interchange and some problems, and then at the very end of the book, Telemachus quiets the suitors down, and uh, so there isn't a huge fight, and everybody trails off homeward drowsily to bed. And uh, so then... That leads us into book 19.